In the previous two lectures, we've talked about natural selection and random effects in evolution. The fact, however, that natural selection takes some time to happen means that there can be mismatches between the current state of the population and the conditions under which that selection started to operate. And it can also happen if there is variation in space. So those are the two major ways in which a mismatch can occur. And mismatch is important because it produces a state of maladaptation. In other words, evolution doesn't just produce adaptations. It is also a process that can produce maladaptations or things that are not appropriately adapted to current circumstances. In time, this happens when the environment is changing faster than the population can adapt. We have some important recent human examples. The agricultural revolution, urbanization, and hygiene have all resulted in maladaptations either in diet or our microbiome, and that has resulted in medical conditions that are important in modern populations. In space, organisms can move from environments where they're well adapted to environments where they're not well adapted. And human examples have to do with migration and with immigration. Mismatches in time. Before agriculture, we primarily ate lean meat, fruit, roots, nuts, and seeds. We had little sugar, we had no refined starch, we had less salt, and we did not drink milk after we were weaned. That was because we had no dairy animals. They hadn't been domesticated yet. Before hygiene and antibiotics, our microbiome was quite different. Almost everyone had worms of some sort, and our gut flora was diverse and often helpful. Our gut bacteria, for example, mediate uh, our energy uptake. Some of them protect us from diabetes, and others produce vitamins for us. In the Stone Age, ad addictive substances and technologies were quite rare, in, or they were completely absent. There was no tobacco, there was no alcohol, there was no heroin, there was no cocaine, there was no television, email, Twitter, or Facebook, there were no horses, bicycles, cars, or planes, there was a lot more movement, and there was less sitting around. And that combination of conditions meant that our bodies were selected to conditions in the past that they are not currently encountering. That generates a host of problems. Let's just take milk. This ad is a Danish ad for drinking milk. And as you'll see, Scandinavians are able to drink milk as adults at very high frequency. The point of the milk example is that it shows us that evolution takes hundreds of generations to adjust traits to current conditions. And that lag produces serious mismatches in our reactions to novel conditions. So how does that work? We think it has been since about, uh, say, six to 10,000 years before Christ, so eight to, say, 12,000 years ago, since cattle, sheep, and goats have been domesticated. A mutation that enabled adults to digest lactose and give them, gave them a selective advantage of 5% because they would have more calcium, they would have more protein, they would have a more stable food supply, it would take 8,000 years to increase a mutation with that characteristic from 1% up to 90%. And that's just a very straightforward, simple Mendelian trait with two alleles under selection. Now, we now know we can reconstruct this process to a certain degree. We can actually recover Neolithic pottery that has traces of milk in it. We can recover the bones of domesticated cattle, sheep, and goats, and we can date them with carbon-14. And that's shown us that our Neolithic history was a bit more complicated. There were local responses to selection, and there were immigration from areas where lactase persistence had already started to evolve. So if it has already gotten up to a fair frequency in one spot, and then there was a founder event, it could go to even higher frequency in a derived population. Depending on the region that we look at and the level of immigration that we assume, the selective advantage of drinking milk 
would only have to have been between about 0.5% and 3% to account for the patterns we see today. Only a few populations in the world are now made up of people, 90% of whom are tolerant to milk as adults. The others are drinking soy milk or not drinking products like that at all. Here is a reconstruction of the geographical distribution of the emergence of lactase persistence in Europe and Asia. This is just one example. Lactase persistence originated several times independently in dairying cultures in Europe, Asia, and Africa. So this is one European or Eurasian origin. We know that milk was being consumed in Anatolia about 8500 before present, so down here, about uh, 6,000 years ago in Britain, and about 3,000 years ago in Scotland. So that capacity, that genetic capacity to digest milk as adults after weaning, apparently originated in a, in a region that is around Hungary and Poland and Bielorussia, and then spread out from there. The point of this example is that it takes time to bring a gene up to high frequency. The current distribution of that capacity across the planet ranges from 95 to 97 percent in Scandinavia to 0 to 10 percent in Eastern Asia. Strong selection and 8,000 years was not enough to fix the trait. That means that mismatches to modernity are plausible for many traits, not just lactose persistence in adults. So, this means we can expect in many different aspects of our biology, if we are encountering an environment now that has changed considerably, we may not be reacting appropriately. This process also occurs in space. For example, migrants introduce new diseases. The people of Europe had not encountered syphilis before Columbus's sailors brought it back. It rapidly moved from sport ports in Spain into Naples. It was initially highly virulent. It killed people within about 40 days of infection. And it spread out of Naples and routed the French army that was invading Italy. The King of France actually pulled his army out of Italy because he was losing so many of his soldiers to this dreadful new, previously unknown disease. In the other direction, Europeans introduced measles, smallpox, bubonic plague, influenza, typhus, diphtheria, scarlet fever to the New World and to, po and to Polynesia, and that caused epidemics that killed 20% to over 90% of the population. So here are some pictures of these diseases. This is tertiary syphilis. This is the model of a head of a man who has died of tertiary syphilis. It's in the Musée de l'Homme in Paris. This is day four measles rash, something which the Aztecs and Polynesians encountered with horror and killed them in high percentages. And here is Charlock or scarlet fever, which also is a disease that has a very high mortality rate in populations that have not encountered it before. Here are a few numbers. Here are a list of smallpox epidemics in the New World. So here the Europeans come over. Most of them have survived smallpox as children. Uh, in later years, of course, they were being inoculated against it, but at this time it was pretty much uh, prevalent in Europe, and so people encountered it naturally. And you can see that in Latin America and in North America both, smallpox epidemics killed a huge number of people. On Hispaniola, the population of Hispaniola fell from 300,000 people to 1,000 people in the 16th century. So it came in with Columbus and it basically wiped out the Carib Indians on that island. In Mexico, the Spanish invaders introduced a, a set of diseases in Mexico. Some of them uh, spread very rapidly and they so decimated the Aztec army that in fact by the time the Spaniards got to Mexico City, the soldiers were walking over corpses. It was the disease that allowed a small number of Spaniards to conquer a huge Aztec army, and so forth. You can read your way down the list. It's interesting that 
in Connecticut and Massachusetts, there were up to 90% casualties in smallpox epidemics in Native Americans. And yellow fever entered Barbados and Jamaica. It was brought from Africa in populations of slaves in the 17th century, up to 80% casualties uh, in Native Americans, and the slaves were mostly immune because they had encountered, they were the survivors, the adults who had survived yellow fever as children in Africa. A second example where immigrants are leaving pathogens and symbionts behind in this case uh, is African Americans who continue to suffer from sickle cell anemia. Now, as we've seen in, previous, in a previous lecture, sickle cell anemia has a compensating advantage when malaria is present. So the heterozygote is protected against malaria. But the homozygotes suffer from anemia. And that takes time to eliminate that from a population. And in fact, by modern medical intervention, we are helping people who have the sickle cell problem to survive. And so we're changing the selection pressure, making sickle cell less selective and more neutral in African-American populations. Another example is that immigrants coming into developed countries like Sweden suffer from atopies. That would be things like asthma, allergy, and eczema. And that may be related to shifts in their microbiomes. International adoptees and children born in Sweden to foreign-born parents used asthma medication three to four times as often as did foreign-born children. So if you've had an experience as a young child of a very diverse microbiome, you will be less susceptible to asthma and allergy. Another thing that happens with immigrants is that they are switching to a novel diet and to a new lifestyle. And what this means is that if that new lifestyle carries with it health risks, their incidence of disease will shift. Japanese men were twice as likely to die from heart disease in Hawaii as they were in Japan. They were going to a, from a diet that had rice and fish, lots of seaweed, things like that, not very much red meat, into a diet where they were encountering hamburgers and milk and all those sorts of things. That appears to have doubled their risk of heart disease. The other thing that happened to them is that their sons were about 10 centimeters taller. So the Issei generation is the first generation, uh, Ichini Sanshi, that's one, two, three, four in Japanese. So Issei is first generation, Nisei is second generation. The difference is about 10 centimeters in height. That's about that much. So basically the sons of Japanese immigrants were much better adapted to basketball teams than were their fathers. So in summary, the evolution of lactase persistence shows that mismatches in time are real. And it is used as the paradigmatic example for mismatch in time because we can date the origin of dairying archeologically. We can see it in the fossils of dairy animals. So we know that domesticated dairy animals were not around more than about 10,000 years ago. So that means that all diseases of civilization have a logic underpinning them which has been checked and seems plausible. Mismatches in space are occurring when migrants introduce new diseases, when immigrants leave pathogens and symbionts behind, and when immigrants encounter new environments. All of those conditions can produce mismatch.